Good morning, afternoon, evening, from wherever you are, whenever you are, we welcome you to the application assistance presentation for the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law Grid Resilience Formula Grant. My name is Tom King. And I work in the Department of Energy's Grid Deployment Office, where we are implementing the grid resilience provisions from the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law. Just recently, the department released the Administrative Legal Requirements document, also known as ALRD, and we will be accepting applications for the Grid Resilience Formula Grant Program, Provision 40101D. The application window will be open through September 30th. Now, to help states, tribes, and territories with the application process, the Grid Deployment Office is establishing application assistance through different means, including development of templates, example applications, as well as these recorded presentations. The objective of this presentation is to provide an overview of the Grid Resilience Formula Grant and walk through the application process for prospective applicants. I will be providing an overview while my colleague Jay Hanna from the National Energy Technology Laboratory will go through in more detail the registration process, explain the program narrative, and then highlight some of the forms needed for completion. Lastly, Jay will review answers to questions derived from the request for information, as well as the notice of intent that was released back in the spring. So with that, let's get started on the Grid Resilience Grant Overview. And within the Department of Energy and through the BIL, there are three major areas uh, that, that tie into grid resilience. The first one, which we'll be talking about in much more detail, is the grid formula grant, and that's part of the, the 40101 provision, preventing outages and enhancing the resilience of the electric grid. Another area is 40103, and that's program updating our electric grid, ensuring reliability and resiliency. And this is more focused on dem large-scale demonstration process, uh, projects as part of the grid resilience areas. And lastly is the deployment of technologies to enhance grid flexibility, also known as the Smart Grid Investment Grants, and that's part of the provision 40107. You can see the funding amounts that are tied to each of these, and this is the overall funding amount uh, over a five-year period. As you can see, the application um, window is now open for part of the 40101 provisions, and this is broken up into two areas. Uh, later this summer, you will see opportunities uh, for draft funding opportunity announcement for the 40101 industry competitive solicitation for the demonstration program 40103, as well as 40107. So a lot of opportunities coming out along with the current opportunity that's on the street. The Grid Resilience Formula Grant 40101D is an opportunity that uh, provides uh, funding for states and Indian tribes to address all hazards resilience needs. And this is gonna be a five-year program. And each year we wanna continue to improve the process of an objectives-led planning activity and effort. And each year we understand that um, between states and tribes there are different levels of, of sophistication when it comes to the planning process. But one thing we're trying to do is provide technical assistance to continue to improve that planning process so we can have a better idea of where to leverage federal dollars in improving resilience efforts. Uh, the goal of this financial assistance program aligns nicely with the current administration's goals in demonstrating the, the needs of, for, for this country when it comes to energy resilience, focusing on all hazards, including, including climate, uh, risk. It's an opportunity to invest in modernizing our grid infrastructure, as well as bringing and introducing into uh, clean energy technologies and decarbonization solutions. Lastly, it's an opportunity to bring together good paying jobs across the country. So going into more detail of the formula grant program, uh, states, tribes, and territories will receive uh, fundings and allocations based upon a uh, five-part formula uh, focusing on population, area, probability of disruptive events, the severity of these events, and expenditure on mitigating efforts. There is a 15% cost match for states, tribes, and territories. And of the 
allocations, uh, there is a 5% that's available that can be used for technical assistance as well as administrative uh, program fees. Uh, states, tribes, and territories will need to submit to DOE an application that focuses on criteria and methods to award grants, a plan for distribution of funds, and evidence of notice and public hearing of the plan. And that's within the program narrative. And Jay Hanna will be going through much more details in the following and subsequent uh, recording. Formula grant applications will be required to submit applications on an annual basis, but the grants may cover multiple year deployments. And lastly, states, tribes, and territories may be able to um, offer up subawards to eligible entities. And these entities will go into more detail. Uh, before we jump into that, um, you can see the allocations uh, for the states, territories, and tribes. And the summaries are highlighted here. Uh, with Indian tribes, um, the minimum amount is $30,000. And there's about 359 entities within this 30,000 to 100,000 range, 191 entities that are in the 100 to $500,000 range. And then you can see the, the rest of the entities uh, with the Indian tribes, as well as the, the states. So depending on the, the formula grants, we are continuing to improve that process, taking information that we've received from the RFI. And annually, we wanna to continue to improve our data collection process and then modify this formula. As I was talking about before, the eligibility for the Grid Resilience Formula grants, uh, the applicants, eligible applicants, are states, Indian tribes, as well as the territories. And I mentioned the um, applicants are able to provide subawards to eligible entities. And these are listed here being electric grid operators, electricity storage operators, generators, et cetera. There are cost match requirements for the subgrants. Any eligible entity that does receive a subaward shall uh, be required to match 100% of the amount of the subgrant. Uh, there are provisions for small utility set aside. So if a subawardee is um, at less than 4 million megawatt hours of electricity per year, the required cost match is a third of the amount awarded to the subgrantee. The small utility set aside is an important part of uh, the program. And although the wording is confusing with the uh, double negatives, the idea is to be able to set aside a certain percent for small utilities, as you can see here, that's listed on this slide. Some of the key elements within the resilience investment um, program, uh, there are 12 different areas that were called out in the bipartisan infrastructure law. These resilience uh, activities can include everything from the utility pole management and hardening activities, as well as looking at some of the controls um, and advanced controls. Um, on top of that, of being able to, to bring new technologies into the infrastructure uh, design, operation, and maintenance. So you can see a list of uh, the, the 12 different uh, technical areas uh, that have been highlighted. It's also important to note that by statute, there are a couple areas uh, where funding cannot be used. And this is construction of new generating um, facilities or large scale battery storage facilities that is not used for enhancing system adaptive capacity, as well as cybersecurity activities. So funds cannot be used for these types of efforts. Within the program, uh, there's opportunities for technical assistance as well as administrative expenses. So of the amounts available to a state or tribe, 5% uh, can be used for this technical assistance as well as administrative fees. In addition to that, the Department of Energy is able to reserve funding to provide technical assistance uh, that will help states and tribes uh, locally, regionally, as well as nationally. And so the department is currently uh, developing a program that brings together subject matter experts uh, to identify 
opportunities with application assistance, looking at planning processes, um, identifying data management and data opportunities as well as analysis, and then looking at uh, outreach and training efforts. The important part of what success looks like, I think, is this idea of community transformation. And so if there are portions of the, the local regions and within states and tribes uh, that have been impacted by a specific hazard, uh, funds can be used to address and focus on a specific hazard that can make substantial impacts to communities. And that is a key part of what this provision is able to provide. Uh, the idea of uh, creating and sustaining quality jobs and other success metrics, it's an important aspect of, of this overall program. Additionally, when you bring in uh, disadvantaged communities and this Justice 40 initiative within the Department of Energy um, is bringing together collaborative effort with OMB and other agencies to establish goals and programs for better serving these disadvantaged communities. Uh, continue to find out more information in this link that you can see on the slide. Uh, it's continually updating these opportunities and providing more information uh, for identifying disadvantaged communities and some of the impacts that can be, uh, that can be looked at to improve this area. Some notable dates. As, as I mentioned before, there was a request for information as well as notice of intent that was released in the spring. Uh, comments were due in June, early June. Uh, from this information, we were able to process the, the feedback, uh, modify the draft ALRD, and hopefully provide uh, more flexibility, a little bit more time in responding to this. So we did hear uh, messages that came back uh, from uh, stakeholders uh, through this RFI and NOI process. Uh, we are releasing, and the ALRD has released on July 6th, with applications being due by September 30th. Uh, for those uh, applicants that choose not to submit applications, uh, funds and allocations that are not used will be carried over into the general pool and then redistributed based upon uh, the formula grant for the next fiscal year. As I mentioned, with summary of the request for information and the notice of intent, uh, one of the, the main feedback that, that we heard is more time is needed to develop criteria, look at the cost match approval process, um, being able to uh, have time for the public hearings and get feedback from the public hearings. Uh, we also heard more flexibility as desired, including looking at eligible entities, we also heard there were cost match challenges. And lastly, technical assistance and planning process and being able to provide assistance in these areas is important. So I really encourage um, prospective applicants to continue to go to the Frequently Asked Questions site where we tried to address a lot of the feedback that we received. Uh, now, there was a lot of feedback that focused on uh, being able to change the, the law and what was laid out by statute. And those are things that we just had no flexibility in changing, but we also tried to address uh, comments and questions. And uh, as I mentioned, please go to uh, the website and I will provide that uh, link here shortly. If you go to the NETL website, you can find a lot of this information, the link to the ALRD, um, the link to the application forms and templates. Also, the allocation of the grant funds to the states and Indian tribes can be found there. Uh, there's data sources that were used. And lastly, the frequent, uh, frequently asked questions uh, can be found at this site here. As you notice in the lower left-hand corner, there's a resource library. The resource library has um, information documents. Uh, that lay out different planning process and other uh, very useful information. This information can be found at the link uh, as you see here on the website. So I uh, encourage you to continue to go to this site for updates 
on webinars, um, other uh, application assistance uh, opportunities where we're looking at these uh, further webinars, recorded presentations, uh, example applications that, that you can go and, and download and review. And hopefully this will help accelerate the process to go through and apply and um, be able to, to meet the, the September 30th target. And that's the, the overview that I've prepared. Um, next up in the next module, uh, my colleague Jay Hanna from NETL will be walking through more details and specifics of the process to go through the application submittal. So thank you very much for your time. I wish you the best of luck. Thank you.